This is one of my favorite days of the year. I'm serious. Uh, knowing that the Lord has uh, risen. He's not there. He's risen. 2,000 years he's been there. I mean, brother, he has got it under control. There is no, no issues about it. So uh, we're going to have a communion here in just a few minutes. And before we do, uh, we've got some new people that came to our church and, and, uh, since last year. And every year is just one of those things where you just go over the same things. Uh, that you went over last year, and uh, so this year some people may have a little bit better understanding. Uh, communion, there's only two things, two things and two things only, that the Christian body is commanded to do. And one of them is communion, the other is baptism. Uh, if you haven't been baptized, you should be baptized. That's, that's a commandment. Uh, you, we say a lot of times we can't do, I, I can't live all, yeah, but there's two things you can do, and one of them is a baptism and the other, I got baptized, I got wet as soon as I realized, uh, I was, I was baptized as a Catholic infant, I uh, didn't have a clue about that at all, didn't know nothing about that, my mom says, but you were baptized, I said, well, I didn't know anything about that, and she goes, but I was there, I said, I was too, but I still don't remember any part of it, and I said, I need to remember it, so it's called believer's baptism, I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and it's a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the next one is communion, and, and it is a uh, communion is one of the ordinances instituted by Christ himself. It's in Matthew 26, 26 through 29. Uh, uh, Christ only held communion with his disciples one time on the eve of, eve of Gethsemane. Uh, the last night he was with them, he had a, a supper uh, the, and he and the next day the, the, they was crucified. Uh, the story of the first communion is told in the Gospels, and and by running the uh, narratives together, this seems to be the correct order. So there's an order of things that went. The disciples gather at the table, and and again they all gather together. They're all laying back, and and it almost be impossible to do the communion the way they did it. Uh, we're doing it in the evening. That that's true. That's easy to do. Uh, uh, they had their service on the first day of the week, and it was in the evening. They worked. Today would have been a work day for them, and, and they had church after work, so it would have been in the evening. Uh, it would be in an upper room. We don't have an upper room, but we do have it up here. If you all feel like coming up here to stand, you can. Uh, they ate unleavened bread, which we are. It was made. Uh, we had one of the ladies. They have little cups now that you can buy, and they have grape juice already in them, and they got a little, little uh, cellophane lid on top of it. And they have little wafers on top. And you can buy these by the cases. And guess what? You don't have to have this little stuff here. You don't have to have anybody. No, this is, you know what communion is? It's part of us. Now, they all used one cup. Well, due to COVID and everything else, we're not going to use one cup because that's kind of unsanitary. The Catholic Church uses one cup. Uh, and they seem to be doing okay with it. Uh, but we're not going to do that. Uh, they used uh, one loaf of bread and, and one cup, and they broke the bread, and then they passed it around. Uh, they were in reclining positions, and I'm not going to put recliners all in here where we can all lay back and do all that. Uh, it was held after a meal, and we're not going to have it. We had an Easter dinner. If you had a they say resurrection day dinner, you can. The purpose, there's a, there's a purpose of the communion. Uh, we do not partake in, of communion to receive forgiveness of sins. We don't do it. The Catholic Church does just that. Uh, you go to confession on Saturday, Sunday you come in, you take the communion, and you're supposed to be all cleaned up, which they have that right. Uh, but when they take the Eucharist, they're saying that their sins are forgiven. They get saved right there. Uh, I, I, I pity them if they sin one second afterwards, and they don't make it till the next week because then they're in trouble. Uh, we do not partake of communion to receive forgiveness of sins. There is no power in the sacrament. Uh, what we're doing, there's no power in that piece of bread or the grape juice at all to do anything for you uh, spiritually other than obedience to Jesus Christ. That's, that's all that is. To give the recipient forgiveness. Can't give you forgiveness. Uh, we partake of communion in obedience to the command of Christ. Uh, and we're going to read some of that over in Corinthians here in a second. We partake in, a, uh, I mean, we, we look at his, we do this in remembrance of him. So you never forget. I, I talked that morning, this morning about remembrance. You don't want to ever forget him. Uh, you want him always at the forefront of your mind. We partake to show forth the Lord's death until he comes. Uh, no one partakes of this meal because he's unworthy. And we're going to have a moment of, of time to get ready. You should have already got ready, but if you haven't, you can. Who may partake of this? I had a question that a few minutes ago. 
Only those who have been born into the family of God have the right to sit at the table of fellowship with the Lord. So parents, if you've got a son or daughter and they are not saved and you know it, don't let them, don't let them take it. Because what you're going to do is you're going to confuse them. Right. It, is, it is more important for them to understand that, hey, that is a special thing. <laughs> Make sure that you're, I mean, every, all the little kids, I got it, man. After church, uh, if there's any of this left, we'll let them have it. They'll think it's like eating gummy bears. But right now, this is not that. This is something totally different than that. Uh, only those who have been bought. Unbelievers and natural man, the natural man, uh, don't belong at this table. Uh, some churches make rules, and, and all churches have a rule. Our rule is simple. If you're born again, and you're baptized, and you know that you got, bap you got born again, your baptism has nothing to do with your salvation, you were born again, you trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you were baptized in a church I mean, really, that's up to you. If you know that you trust your baptism as being a scriptural baptism, you're more than welcome to take communion with us any day, any hour that we take it. I don't have a problem with that. Uh, there's some that say, oh, you got to be baptized in our church. Oh, you got to be members of our church. Uh, I believe the body of Christ is bigger than Anchor Baptist Church. Yeah. Uh, Self-examination uh, self is essential. You, this is one of the most crucial parts. Yeah. Uh, and if you, don't, if you don't examine yourself and be honest with you, you shouldn't take communion. Uh, we had a gentleman here a while back, and he never did take communion. He refused to take it, uh, but he had the opportunity to get the thing right and never would. Uh, that's pride. Only by pride coming again. The Lord wants us to do communion. He wants us to do this. This is, a, this is an ordinance he gave us as a church, as a body. He wants you to do it. So he's made a provision so you can get, uh, get it under the blood real quick and take care of some problems before you get it down the road. Uh, whom I to examine yourself, not the person sitting next to you, not the person in the back, not anybody else. Well, so and so is. I'm not quite as bad as so and so. You're worse, probably. Uh, whom <laughs> yourself? Uh, why will, why should you examine yourself? Because you're wicked. That's why. Uh, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You just need to get the thing right, man. Uh, why why must we examine ourselves? Because it is a direct command of the Scripture. It says, do it. The Bible's telling you. you I don't think the Holy Spirit would put that in our Bible and tell us to do it if he didn't think we needed to do it. You know what he does? He doesn't want to bring the judgment down on us. He doesn't. But he wants you to be uh, partaking in the fellowship of the communion with the church itself. Uh, to eat unworthily brings judgment. I've never seen anybody fall over dead in church eating communion. That doesn't mean it won't happen. And I've never seen anybody get deathly ill. But that doesn't mean it ain't going to happen. I've never seen anything bad happen to anybody, but that doesn't mean it's going to happen. I'm telling you, man, the Lord, Lord is gracious and merciful, but there is some point in life where we have to stop and say, this is serious. This is serious business. Uh, do I really, truly, here's, here's how do I examine myself. Number one, you, do I really believe in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior? I can personally say, yes, I do. Uh, am I born again? Yes, I am. Uh, is there any unconfessed sin? I try not to have any unconfessed sin. If anything comes into my mind, I, I try to lay it before the Lord Jesus Christ 24-7. I don't wait till once a year to do it. Uh, I've known people that waited, or they, I've, I've known people who believe that you didn't have to confess sin, that once you were saved, all your sins were forgiven, which is true on the soul. But in the flesh, you still have the new man, the old man still has some issues going on, and you need to deal with those things. And those things will build up and drive you crazy if you don't take care of them. Uh, how do I examine myself? Uh, do I really believe in the Lord? Uh, uh, am I born again in the family of God? Yes. Is there any unconfessed sin? And then did you really repent? Do you really want to repent? Do you, are you sorry for your sins? Requirement for communion, just bread and wine, which we use grape juice. For not, and, and wine is new wine. It's the squeezed uh, red blood of the grape. It comes right out of the grape. It doesn't have to be uh, hooch, which people think that you can just drink it and, and you can get, a, get whatever you want out of it and you're good to go. So with that said, take your Bibles, go to Luke 22. I told Dave, Brother Dave's going to preach at us here in a few minutes. And uh, he said he had a message. Uh, I was sitting there praying about that thing the other day, and, and the Lord put him on my heart. Uh, and I, I thought, well, hey, and he goes, you know, the Lord put a message on my heart about this. And when I told him, he said, you ain't going to believe this. I said, well, I believe anything anymore. 22, 22, 14. The Lord is sitting there uh, on Wednesday before his uh, disciples, uh, before the crucifixion the next day. And 22, 14, he's, he's sitting there talking to them. 
And it says, And when the hour was come, he sat down and, his, uh, and the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink uh, of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God uh, uh, until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this, or this do in remembrance of me. Likewise, also the cup after supper, saying, The cup of, is uh, the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Father, thank you for your blessings tonight. Thank you for this day. Lord, thank you for a day that we can remember what you did for us uh, on, a, on a lonely hill uh, many, many, many years ago. Uh, but Lord, that day was planned uh, many, many, many years before that. And we just want to thank you. I, I want to personally thank you for all you've done and allowed us, uh, Lord, the, the knowledge and the wisdom and the heart, Lord, and, and just, the, the not, just to be able to, to call on your name and know that you're there in the middle of the night when we're lonely and, and tired and hurt and sad and sorry, sorrow uh, creeps in. Lord, you're always there to cheer us up and to lift us up. And, Lord, you give us a couple things that we can do. Uh, Lord, this is one of them. And, Lord, we may not be able to accomplish many things, but there's two things we can all do, and this is one of them. Uh, Lord, I do pray now that you'd bless the, the, the communion service and the, the message afterwards, and we'll praise you and honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to say just a couple things. Jesus Christ implemented uh, uh, the communion service right here. He said, he said, with desire, I have desired. Jesus Christ wants to have a communion service with us. That's his desire. With desire, I have desired. Well, if he desired that, so should we. It's just that simple. Uh, 17, it says, and he took the cup and gave thanks. Jesus Christ's direction for the communion service. He said, this is how it should go. And he took a cup and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. So we have uh, little... We have bread, and we have little. Uh, we have bread, and then we have little cups of grape juice, uh, for sanitary purposes. That's what it's all there for. He says, "Take this and divide it among you, for I say I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come." And he took the bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, "This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me." He never wants you to forget him. You know what this does? We could do it every day. We could do it every. You could do it as many times as you want. Uh, I think sometimes we we make it uh, less meaningful. Ritual, yeah, it becomes a ritual thing where we just do it over and over and over. It's not as meaningful if you do it. And I think uh, Easter or either Resurrection Sunday is the perfect time for this because this is the day that is to be remembered. And we could have done it on Wednesday, but I like doing it Sunday evening uh, because it's the first day of the week and it's the day that they met. And it's, it's not the day that they actually had it on, but they, we wouldn't had to go back to Tuesday to do that. And I don't think y'all want to come in on a Tuesday. So we ain't going to do that. But Jesus Christ uh, gave a direction. Go over to 1 Corinthians 11. Now, that's Old Testament. Anything prior to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ is Old Testament. Uh, although it says New Testament before Matthew, it is still Old Testament. Uh, Jesus Christ has not died yet. Uh, he is still alive, and as long as he's alive, the, uh, the atonement for our sin has not been accomplished yet. And anything goes at that point. A lot of different things happen, but the Lord knows what's happening. It's a, it's a process. But by the time you get over to uh, uh, Corinthians, Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, and Paul is our apostle, apostle to the Gentiles. Paul wrote four, uh, uh, 14 New Testament books, which open up the entire scriptures for us. And in 1123... Paul starts talking about this thing right here. He says, for I have received of the Lord. So Paul was personally trained by Jesus Christ on what to do. And Paul is revealing what to do to the church. He's saying, church, this is what you do. He goes, for I have received of the Lord that which also I deliver unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Paul, Paul's direction for the communion uh, is sitting right here in those verses. Uh, when he says, verse 26, he goes on, he says, For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he comes. 
Well, the Lord hasn't come back yet. You know how you know that? Because we're here. I'm here, and I know he says that you may know you have eternal life. I know I'm saved, so I'm assuming some of you guys are too. So in that case, we're still here, and the Lord hadn't come back yet. You know what we're supposed to do? We're always supposed to do this. It is a command. It isn't, it isn't oh, well, if you feel like it. It's a command. Uh, it's good for you to do it. You know what it does? It makes you move to one side instead of the other. It forces you on this little side over here. It's little, like little baby steps. It's a good thing to do, I, and I think you should do it. Uh, you, if you're sitting in there tonight and you say, well, I've got sin, I'm going to give you a few minutes. And all you have to do is bow your head. Uh, over in 1 John it says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Right now, if we say we have no sins, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So you've got sin. The thing to do is just get it under the blood. Uh, Wednesday night I mentioned it. If you've already done that since Wednesday night now, you should have just about everything covered. If you haven't, you're going to have a few minutes here that you're going to get time to say, Lord... And the things that pop in your mind, you ought to just say, Lord, forgive me for those, forgive me for those, forgive me for those. The Lord wants you to take this communion. Paul's direction, he says, for as often as you do this, as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Paul's warning, there is a warning. And brother, I'll tell you what, I, we, don't we don't take our Bibles as serious as we ought to take them. It's a serious book. Wherefore, if Paul said this, the Holy Spirit told him to say this, wherefore, whosoever shall eat of this bread... And drink of this cup, and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily. That means you got sin in your life and you just really don't care to get it out. Shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. And you could be held accountable. Now I'm telling you, the Lord's gracious. Uh, this is not something to scare you, but you ought to be, uh, it's, a, it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a living God. It says, the beginning of wisdom, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If he told Paul to say something like that, then he's trying to tell you how serious this thing actually is. And you ought to take it serious. Then Paul desired desire of the communion for the service. He, he, Paul has a desire also. He says, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat the bread and drink the cup. Paul wants you to have communion. Paul's second warning, verse 29, says, For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself. That's a strong statement. Not discerning the Lord's body. It is a piece of bread. But, but in essence, it's, he told us to do this in remembrance of him. And you're doing something that they did back then that the Lord gave us. And for 2,000 years, we've been doing it. The church has been doing it. Uh, some churches do it wrong. Some churches do it right. Uh, we're going to try to do it the best way we can, the right way, the biblical way, the only way I know. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. That means they're dead. Uh, this thing can bring on sickness. It can bring on, you say it's just a piece of bread and some grape juice. You got it. But spiritually, the Lord said, this thing makes you stop and think about where you stand with him. That's why he gave, you know, baptism is an interesting thing. The reason I got baptized is I wanted to be like him. And I knew, I knew this 43 years ago, 42 years ago, whatever it was. I knew right then and there that this is what I, and I jumped into, I mean, if he had had the baptism open that Sunday, I'd have got wet right there. I did not care what anybody thought about me. I cared about what Jesus thought. And if he thought enough about me to tell me to get baptized, I'm going to get done. I'm going to get wet. That's done. It's over. It's finished. Uh, and I did it. And I never regretted it. I never, uh, 1985, I'll tell you this. 1985, I got, uh, I started questioning my salvation. You need to make sure you're saved. I started questioning my salvation. And I said, Lord, did I really get saved? I didn't say everything on the back of that little track. I didn't say all this stuff like the fellowship track says you should say. I just, I just asked you to save me on that back porch. I said, did I really get saved? And I had this little, little white angel on this side and a little devil on this side. And one was whispering in this ear and one was whispering. I was getting confused. So I, got, I, could, I remember the couch. I could see the couch right now. I remember sitting down, getting on my knees, uh, right on the, on the left, end, left side of that couch. I got right down there. I had a fellowship track in my hand. And I started, I think it was all this I did for thee. And I started reading the back of that track. And I said, Lord, I said, it says right here that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God had raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. I said, I believe that, I believe it, I believe it, I believe it. And I went through that whole track, and I said, now there, I've done it. I said, I still think I got saved on that back porch in 1980. But if I thought that right there is where I got saved, I'd have got baptized again. Why? Because my first baptism wouldn't have counted because I just got wet. The second one is called believer's baptism. 
Well, brethren, what you're doing here is you're believing in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You're, you're doing a communion and remembering his death and what he suffered till he come back and get us out of here. Now, we're going to take a second or two to pray. And I'm going I'm to take about three or four minutes, five minutes, however long. And uh, if, if I get ready to start and you say, hey, I need a few more seconds or a few more minutes, raise your hand and don't just stop. We've got all night. I've got plenty of time. I would personally rather we get everything under the blood and we all have communion together and we do this the right way and we please the Lord. Y'all ready? Father, thank you for your blessings tonight. Lord, in a moment, we're going to have our communion service. And Lord, I, I just want to thank you today uh, for all you've done. Lord, there's no way we could possibly have ever got to this point without you and the mercies and kindnesses and grace you had for us over the years and long suffering. And Lord, you give us a couple things to do, and one of them is communion. And Lord, you say in the Bible, you want us to have communion. You tell us to examine yourself. And our brother Paul, Lord, uh, quotes the same thing. Uh, he just uh, reiterates the exact same thing here in Corinthians. And Lord, he says, examine yourself. Lord, I pray for the next couple of minutes uh, that uh, we examine ourselves. And Lord, if anything comes up into our mind, that we put it under the blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And, uh, Lord, uh, that we just confess that thing and get it under the blood and, and get it forgiven. Uh, Lord, that we can all uh, observe communion uh, together as a body of believers. Lord, thank you for this privilege. It is a privilege to do this. Lord, it, whenever you give us something to do, it's a privilege to be able to do something to serve you. And, Lord, as servants, uh, we're here to serve you tonight. Lord, thank you again for the men that's going to come forward here in a second to uh, give this out, give the, the uh, elements out. And, Father... Uh, I pray that you put your fingers upon them, your hand upon them, Lord, put your hand upon our lives. Uh, Lord, we want our next year to be uh, better than the last, and Lord, we want to get closer to you this year than we were last year. And Lord, uh, we just want you to use us uh, for your honor and your glory. And Father, we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, well, the four men was chosen. Y'all can go on and keep praying if you want. Uh, the four men that was chosen to do this, if you, got, if you're, you feel like you're okay, come on down, and we will start uh, getting stuff ready to pass out. You guys need more time? Good? Good? You good? Andrew? Okay. Paul said... Anybody need more time? Okay. You want to take the, the bread? It's the first one. <clears throat> Do you want to pass it out? 
Can somebody go back to the nursery? The scripture says uh, in 1 Corinthians 11, 24, And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Father, again, thank you for your blessings. Lord, I do ask you to bless uh, this communion and the bread that we're about to partake. Uh, Lord, uh, help, it to draw, help us just to, in our minds and in our hearts, Lord, help us to remember you till you come back and get us. And we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.
says, Paul talks here and he goes, uh, and after the same manner he also took the cup, uh, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty five, when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Lord, thank you for allowing us to do, do something that you, you gave us permission to do and a command to do. Lord, I do pray that you bless this communion, help us to not forget in the upcoming year all the things that you've done for us. And Lord, that you just bless our church and keep using us. And Father, again, we'll praise you on you in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Uh, they sang a hymn before they left, but we're going to wait till after Brother Dave preaches. And then Brother Joe will come up after that, and we'll sing a hymn, and uh, and we'll go home, and we'll go to the barn, as they say. Brother Dave. seen it done better that's just scriptural and uh that's the way we ought to be take your bible go to uh first corinthians chapter 11 i was reading this the other day and uh and uh it, i had some notes i had some thoughts on on uh on this passage that deals with what we just did and uh I stopped reading and started writing and lord put this together and i had things I was going to do a Thursday morning, and the Lord had other ideas, and I spent all morning with this, and, uh, and uh, of course, I wasn't supposed to preach tonight or anything. I just thought this would go well, and I thought, it occurred to me to tell your pastor that, man, I got this message, in my, and the Lord said, no, and I is that, that okay, and I drove over here this morning, and I thought, man, maybe if I, and the Lord said, nope. And I came in the door, and he said, do you want to preach tonight? And I knew it was God. <laughs> Amen. I'm not saying that to say if it doesn't go well, it's his fault. It'll be my fault. I'll take the blame. But uh, amen. We're going to read those verses. I, well, no, we're not. We're not. For the sake of time, because I was given an incredibly limited amount of time, and it'll be a miracle <laughs> if I make it. Amen. Uh, but it, it, as you just read, as you just saw, you, as you just were just reminded, uh, what we just did, and Paul gave it to us in 1 Corinthians 11, and uh, reiterated what the Lord gave us already, and we saw that in Luke 22, and, and what he said, uh, uh, this do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now, that's referred to as communion. I've heard it referred to as the Lord's Supper. I've heard it referred to as the Lord's Table. And different places, a lot of different churches I've been in, they call things differently. And, and like it's just been explained to you, uh, this is one of the two ordinances uh, that's given to the New Testament church. And personally, I don't care what you call it, just so long as you do it. Amen. And when you do it, uh, you do it uh, remembering Jesus Christ. Uh, the problem with, with doing it weekly, like some do, or doing it monthly on a certain Sunday, it just becomes just habit, ritual. And I've been in places where I was extremely uncomfortable because nothing was explained. It was just going through motions. And I thought, this is serious stuff. And uh, when I know it's coming, when I know I'm going to be uh, in a place that's doing it, whether the, it gets explained right or not, I take it seriously, my wife takes it seriously, and we examine ourselves. Amen. So we do it in remembrance of him, and it was to remind us, that whole thing was to remind us of the Lord Jesus Christ's willingness to present his body, a dying sacrifice for us, and remembering that will make it a lot easier to present our body, a living sacrifice for him. So let's pray, Father, thank you for grace, and I Thank you for this privilege, and I pray that you just help me say something to you, help in the blessing to my church, and I pray that you get some honor and glory out of it. In Jesus Christ's name, amen and amen. He said, it's in remembrance of me. So that'd be the title. If we need a title, we're just going to hit some things about the Lord Jesus Christ tonight 
uh, that we need to remember. It's not new stuff. It's not stuff we don't know. It's stuff we're to be reminded of. Uh, Peter was told uh, to stir them up uh, by putting them in remembrance. Amen. So number one tonight, uh, remember Gabriel. Now, we live in the day and age of the 5G network, which I have no idea what that really means. But I, I just say that, say this, this is the 7G. I got 7Gs. So number one, we're going to remember his birth. But, you know, I had to get a G. So remember Gabriel. Take your Bible and go to uh, Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1 and verse 26. And I'm not going to tarry long. It says that in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God uh, under the, unto a city in, of Galilee named Nazareth. And to a virgin a spouse to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, uh, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. If there's anything that you should expi aspire to have the Lord say about you, boy, there it is right there. I mean, we don't mention Mary much because as reactionaries, Bible believers are reactionaries. If one crowd says something too much, we go the other way and leave it alone. Amen. But I'm going to tell you what, Mary has got quite a resume. Amen. And the Lord thought a lot of her, and I think a lot of her too. And I don't worship her or anything like that. But uh, it did say, it said, uh, uh, blessed art thou among women. Now, there's some people that read that or maybe you're taught that. I don't know. I was never, you know, anything else really. But uh, 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 they say, uh, blessed art thou above women. And that ain't what it says. It says among. Now, there was a woman that was blessed above women, and that's over in uh, Judges chapter 5, and her name was Jael, and, and, and that was said about her because she drove a spike through a guy's head. I like that. I, I like that she's blessed above women. But I want you to remember uh, Gabriel in, in that he was the one uh, that delivered the message and, and that Jesus Christ was going to be born of a virgin. Uh, Matthew chapter 1 said it like this in verse 23 Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. That's deep right there, boy. Amen. Amen. So we uh, remember his birth. We remember that he was born of a virgin. Uh, he was raised in a carpenter's home. Amen. It says that in, uh, in uh, Matthew 13, 55, is this not the carpenter's son? Uh, is not his mother called Mary and his brethren, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? Uh, I don't know where they get that Mary was a perpetual virgin, uh, but they didn't get it out of my Bible. That's right. All right, so Jesus Christ uh, was a carpenter's uh, son, raised in a carpenter's blue-collar home, and... Uh, you know, I, I'm a carpenter's son, too. My dad was a carpenter. My dad was a master carpenter. And I look back many times through the years, and I wish I'd have paid a lot more attention to what he could have taught me. But I had other ideas, and I wanted to do it my way, and my carpenter's skill would fall under the category of card-carrying wood butcher. I can take a nice piece of lumber and make a pile of, pl I mean, I can buy the saw, I can get the gear, and I can make a pile of sawdust, boy, like nobody's business. I wish I'd have paid attention to what I could have learned, and I say that to say this, some of you are in a place in your life where you would do well to pay attention to what your mom or dad, either one, could teach you because I hope it's not a shock to you, but let me be the one to tell you, you don't know as much as you think you do. Hallelujah. And you might know some things and you mingle your gift and your intellect with what you can learn from experienced people and you'll come out even better. Amen. Jesus Christ not only was raised in a, a carpenter's home, he was a carpenter himself. Amen. It says in uh, Mark chapter 6, in verse 3, is not this the carpenter, uh, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judah and Simon, and are not his sisters with us? And they were offended at him. He was just a regular guy. Regular guy, like I said, 
grew up in a blue-collar family, in a blue-collar home. His dad worked with his hands. He taught him. He worked with his hands. Amen. Until he got old enough for the ministry. Amen. What did he do? He worked a job. And I would give some good advice here tonight that uh, I know people that have a call, amen, and then they get an education, but then they lack specific direction. And, and that's the way it goes, amen. And I'll tell you what you need to do is learn to do something uh, until you get specific direction from God. Amen. I know people that got the desire, but they're looking for a calling. You don't have to look for a calling. It'll find you. Amen. And so it's good to learn something. Now, a friend of mine pastored up in uh, uh, Fairbanks, Alaska, and, uh, and, uh, and he specifically started a Bible institute, which included a vocational school. And he was a hard worker, and he was good like Brother Stahl. You could have been the uh, dean of that place because the guy could do plumbing and he could do carpentry and he could do electric and he could do all that stuff so he started a school and encouraged men to come up there to not only learn the bible knowing that everybody that goes to bible school isn't called to preach isn't called a pastor some just getting a bible education you can't go wrong there we're not a bunch of dumb sheep we're sheep but it's good uh, for for or for anybody that's born again to learn bible that's why we have sunday school that's why we have bible studies and he said, I'm going to make a school where people that come say, well, I'm not going to Bible school because I don't feel called to preach. Well, come and learn the Bible and learn how to fix, uh, fix uh, plumbing. Learn how to fix. And it was a great idea. And I thought that was really smart. And I think it's not going on anymore because, like I say, the problem was it was in Fairbanks, Alaska. Amen. Which isn't a big deal. You can fly there. I got tickets to fly there in September with my wife, not January, September, and uh, go up there and preach a couple of meetings. But, uh, but uh, we're going to go in for a couple of weeks and come back out before it turns night for six months. I think that might have been, I don't know. But uh, we're talking about, he said, do this in remembrance of me. And, and so let's remember his birth. Let's remember his birth and, and remember that the message was delivered by Gabriel. That's the G. Ready for another one? How about Galilee? Galilee. Mark, Matthew, I'm sorry. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 25 uh, tells us that, that his ministry began in Galilee. Amen? Let's remember that. Uh, it says in uh, four, Matthew 4, 25, and there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee and from Decapolis and from Jerusalem and from Judea and from beyond Jordan. Boy, there was, that's a multitude. And his ministry began there. Uh, his first miracle was in Galilee. And we all know that because, let me tell you what, if I go to another wedding and the guy uses the marriage in Cana to introduce the marriage, I mean, I'm going nuts. I would never use that just because I know some people, that's the only verse they know. And uh, so I'm just saying it. But the truth of the matter is, John chapter, I'm going fast, listen fast. It says in John chapter 2 and verse 11, this beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested for his glory and his disciples believed on him. So remember Galilee, amen. Now he started, uh, he had lowly common beginnings and he started his ministry, not in a big city, not where there was a lot of attention. He started it in Galilee, up there, amen. And, uh, and uh, what else? His first message was in Galilee. First time he preached, uh, Matthew 4 and 12 says this. It says, uh, now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed from Galilee. And verse 17 said, from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say. His first message is right here in Matthew chapter 4. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven uh, is at hand. I, I wonder if repentance was any more popular uh, back then uh, than it is now because uh, what I see traveling around is there's people I mean they claim to be Bible believers that won't touch it I mean you gotta if you gotta fear if you're preaching this book and you gotta get in and apologize before you say something remotely rough something ain't right amen, amen. amen. I noticed your preacher doesn't apologize for giving it to you straight from the Bible. We're wicked sinners. I need that. You need that. The Bible says that. 
Amen. Uh, but there's places uh, they don't. I, my, I've been to places where I preach it, try to preach it straight, and I don't get asked back for, for fear of maybe offending somebody. Who would you offend? The, the money guy? I don't know. But uh, uh, that's not biblical. Amen. Jesus Christ preached his first message in Galilee, and uh, his first four, you know this, his first four disciples were from Galilee. And he called uh, them fishermen there in Matthew 4, 18. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon and Peter. Uh, and Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, uh, casting that into the sea, for they were fishers. And then the next verses, he called James and John, sons of Zebedee. And so we're remembering him, and we're going to remember his birth. He was born of a virgin. Amen. And uh, that's why he could do what he did. And I don't want to get ahead of myself. But uh, 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 the first, uh, uh, first thing we remember is his birth, because he had to be born. Praise the Lord. He had a birthday. Amen. Uh, and then, uh, but, you know, he did just, he stayed below the, like this, he stayed below the radar until he went into the ministry to do what he came to do, started at 30 years old, and uh, it all started in Galilee. And that's real, real important to remember. And uh, how do you know? Because it's, like, this is all right out of the Bible. I mean, I didn't Google this. I didn't read a commentary on it. I just opened my Bible. It's all over there. All right? So then uh, that's two. Now number three. Number three. How am I doing? Pretty good. There's only seven, so this will be a miracle. Uh, number three is Gethsemane. Now remember Gethsemane. Now, we talked about the first communion. We talked about it over there in Matthew 26, and then it said, and afterward, uh, they went out, and after they had sung in him, uh, they went out. Of course, things went downhill from there for a while, but especially for Peter, but uh, we need to remember Gethsemane. That's where Jesus Christ's purpose was declared. Uh, Matthew 26, 36, it says this, Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith uh, unto his disciples, uh, Sit ye here, while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him, verse 37, and he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, you know, you know who that is, and uh, James and John, okay, and, uh, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. The Lord Jesus Christ had a huge burden. He knew what was coming. And uh, this took place in Gethsemane. And in verse 40, now he told him there, he told them, uh, uh, sit here and pray, and then he took those other two, and uh, he went to pray, and he, it's pretty intense prayer, and it was for you and I. And in verse 40, he comes back, and he finds them sleeping. He finds them sleeping, and he said, verse 41, watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation, for the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And uh, I get that, and when the Lord said it, and I'm not correcting it, but I find that our problems sometimes, oftentimes, too often, in doing what the Lord has told us to do, is that the flesh is way too strong. That's what Paul refers to in Romans chapter 7. He knows what to do. He wants to do right, but there's something hindering him. And beloved, tonight that's flesh. And you and I got flesh too. And that flesh ain't saved. And every one of us is capable of every wicked thing that we can sit up on our high horse and point fingers at condemn. And that's why it's important to come together at a time like this where the focus isn't on us and where we came from or what we did, but on him and why it came and what he did so we don't get thinking too highly of ourselves than we ought. Because that flesh, boy, how many ever heard it said like this? Three parts, three parts to the Christian. Body, soul, and spirit. How many ever heard that? Body, soul, and spirit. Now, you know the Bible doesn't say that, don't you? The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5, it says spirit, soul, and body. That's God's order of importance. The body's last. Amen? But boy, how many times, I mean, I've been guilty of myself. You just get used to that body, soul, and spirit. Because that body wants to go to the preeminent position, and it will, man, every chance it gets. Amen. But uh, in the context there, he said the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak when it comes to spiritual stuff. That's the context. Lord Jesus Christ, it said in verse 42, he went away again the second time and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if this cup may not pass from me except I drink it, 
Thy will be done. That's his purpose. Amen. To do the will of God. In John chapter 4 and 34, it says this, uh, Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and finish his work. He didn't have a personal agenda. Amen. His agenda was to do what he was supposed to do. And that ought to be our agenda too. And the Bible says we're not our own. We're bought with a price. And going back to that stinking flesh, our flesh got ideas contrary to what the Lord would have us to do. And that's the battle. And the Bible said the flesh is, uh, uh, let me see, the flesh is contrary to the spirit. How's that say it? How's it say it? Uh, uh, Galatians 5, 17. Somebody help me out. For the, come on. I, okay. All right. It wasn't a quiz show, but now it is. Uh, stop that clock. i got to take a couple seconds here for, for this. For the fle Oh, man, I quote this all the time, and that's how God does it, keep you humble. Uh, but I don't mind. I don't mind because uh, it's good to be humble. Uh, it says, for the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and they're contrary one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. That's written to believers, buddy. That's a New Testament church just like this one, amen. And the battle is with that flesh, and we have got to get our, and Jesus Christ being our example, we've got, uh, we need to focus on, just like he did, we need to focus on finishing the work, doing the will of God, finishing the work that God gave us to do. Verse 43, it says that he came. Now he went and he prayed. Now he only took three disciples with him. He took them and he said he parked nine of them. And then he uh, took the three and uh, didn't even take Andrew. Took the three, the inner circle, we call it. And uh, that might be in the NIV, I don't know. But, uh, but uh, we know that Peter, James, and John had a special place. They were up on the Mount of Transfiguration with him. And, uh, and he took them farther than the rest of them. And he told them to pray. You pray, and then you three come with me, and you pray. And he went on ahead even to get alone with God. <laughs> Amen. And, uh, and uh, the earth, these are his three best men. And they fell asleep. Well, you know, we're human. And the uh, Lord knew it. And he mentioned it. He rebuked them a little bit, reproved them, let's put it that way. And then he come back in verse 43, and he went, well, he, he reproved them. And he said, now watch him pray. And he went on to pray some more. And he came back again. There, we pick it up in verse 43. And he came and found them asleep again. Amen. For their eyes were heavy. Verse 20, 37 said, his heart was heavy, but we find that the disciples, their, their eyes were heavy. Maybe they stayed up too late last night too. Like I tell you, preachers look at their congregations on Sunday morning and some of their best people are having a hard time staying awake. And sometimes it's from work and sometimes it's for a lot of reasons. Sometimes it's just your priorities are a little out of whack and you're not uh, praying up and going to bed in time to get up fresh looking forward to church. Amen. 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 I'm guilty of it. I've been, I've been guilty of it. I'll be guilty of it again. Doesn't change anything. Amen. Now, what I want you to notice is this. Now, I was reading through that the other day, and it said uh, that the disciples slept second time, eyes were heavy, and I thought, boy, there's a picture of Laodicea right there. There's the church age. That's where we live. Amen. Can't pray for an hour of sleep. But then it occurred to me, this isn't the typical church. This isn't the multitude. These aren't believers. These, aren't, these are the elite. These are what we would consider equivalent to the by King James Bible believer. And I'm going to tell you what, uh, beloved, according to the Apostle Paul, uh, 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 the, the Bible believers uh, too often asleep at the wheel. He says, awake the righteousness. It's time to wake up. Because we've been singing about the Lord coming back. Do you believe that? He's coming back. Amen. Amen. I don't want to be guilty of that. I don't want to be guilty of, uh, of being sleeping when the Lord says uh, uh, we're supposed to pray, when we're supposed to witness, when we're supposed to go to church. I don't want my flesh to have that control. It will. Sometimes it does. But then I repent of it and get it right. You know what we do? Sometimes we just write it into the script. Say, well, that's just the way it is. That's, yeah, that's just the way it is, but that's not the way it's supposed to be if you've got the Spirit of God inside of you. Amen? Amen. All right, so uh, uh, Luke 22 and 44 said this. Now we're talking about Gethsemane. It says, uh, uh, and being in agony. 
So Luke talks about when he went off to pray ahead of the uh, disciples, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Just like one of the hymns. I don't know which one it was. But we talk about uh, his sweat uh, uh, being like drops of blood in its Bible. It's right there. I'll tell you what, I agree with your preacher, man. Uh, now, all them songs aren't 100% uh, uh, doctrinally sound, but boy, many of them are. And you read through some of them, you read through some of them songwriters, some of them we know about and heard about. And uh, uh, Fanny Crosby, that girl was connected now. She had a relationship with God. She had a walk with God. You can see it in what she's saying. I'm going to tell you what, Charles Wesley uh, didn't know uh, how to rightly divide to save his life. And you read through some of them old Methodist hymns, that boy was in touch with God. Amen. And then you get some of the stuff that gets played and passed off for, for Christian music these days, and it doesn't stir your heart. Amen. That's what, again, that's what I like uh, uh, those old hymns of the faith, man, because they're based on that Bible. Amen. Because then it's not just, well, I'm a Bible person. No, the Spirit of God that wrote that book, the Spirit of God that lives within you, the Spirit of God that bears witness to that book, when you read it, when you study it, when you hear it preached, when you hear it taught, the Spirit of God that also touched some of those hymn writers and moved them will use that to speak to your heart again. We got, we got, it says out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. We got so many witnesses. Shame on us when we don't avail ourselves to them. Amen. Amen. I never was the kind of guy that was happy in the shallow end of the pool. And uh, I'm glad God's not got me in the shallow end of the pool now. Amen. amen. And uh, amen, amen, and amen. Now, it says that uh, uh, being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Now, Jesus Christ earnestly prayed. Uh, uh, it, it, no, yeah. He agonized earnestly in prayer for what he was getting ready to do. This is just before, I'm going to mention that too. He was arrested just prior, uh, within a day of Calvary. He's agonizing in prayer, not for himself. He's agonizing in prayer for what he's about to do for you. Not them, you, me. And I just look at that and I think it seems reasonable that, that, that we should earnestly agonize in prayer for the souls around us because of what the Lord Jesus Christ wants to do for them. Amen. What? Save them. That's what he wants? How's he going to reach them? Hello, <laughs> that's our job. This ain't a clubhouse. This ain't a social gathering. The uh, Lord put a lighthouse right here on this property, and it's to reach people. And some of you are the fruit of it. Amen? Some of you have come from other places and found a haven where you've grown spiritually so you can take what you've learned out there and use. And some of you are here because this is where you heard it, and this is where you got it. Hey, man, that's the way it's supposed to work. Amen. That way God gets the glory. Amen. That's what I'm seeing. All right, and we're talking about Gethsemane. Just let me add this before we move on. And, uh, and uh, uh, his betrayal was also in Gethsemane. In Luke 22, 48, it said, but, but Jesus said unto him, uh, Jesus, or Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss. This message had a lot more verses in it but then I got this 30-minute thing, so I spent all that, thank you very much, all afternoon trying to edit this down, and uh, we might make it. You know what hurts is I don't remember what time I started, neither do they, and probably, I don't know, you might. <laughs> Amen. He was betrayed. He was abandoned by all of them, not just Peter. Uh, he was arrested all that happened in Gethsemane. He said, this do in remembrance of me. Uh, you know, that little Catholic, uh, I, I'm, I, well, that little painting with a little drop of blood, and you know, the, that's not accurate, man. Uh, we need to remember the truth of the matter. We need to remember what he went through. We need to remember what they did to him before he got uh, nailed to the cross. But uh, so then Gethsemane, next, uh, remember Golgotha. Remember Golgotha. Now it says this in John chapter 19, in verse 17, and he bearing his cross went forth uh, into a place called the place of a skull, uh, which is called in the Hebrew 
a Golgotha. Amen. A lot of Harley stuff, Harley gear. It's got skulls on it. And I, you know, that stuff never meant anything to me before. And, uh, and, uh, but it does now. And so I stay away from all that stuff. I don't have nothing to do. I'm not getting skull t-shirts. I'm just avoiding all that stuff as I read through my Bible. And that's what, uh, God, God, the place where they crucified my hope my Savior was called the place of the skull, and it said, which is called in the Hebrew, Golgotha. Amen. Thank you, Joe, for mentioning that in song. Everything so far has gone together with what Lord been laying on my heart for the last couple days. Golgotha. Now, we know it better as Calvary. And it says that in Luke 23, 33. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, that's the Greek word. And that's the only time it shows up. But that's enough, boy, because when I see that word, man, it, it, it tugs at my heart. It said there were crucified, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Uh, we need to remember Golgotha. It was in Golgotha that he was mocked by the very ones he came to save. That would have been hard for me. Yeah. Amen. But uh, that's, the, that's the truth of the matter. They said in Matthew 27, 42, he saved others himself. He cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. And I'm here to tell you, he could have come down. He didn't have to go up there. He didn't need 12 legions of angels. But he stayed up there. And it's a good thing he did because if he would have come down, amen, if he would have reacted to all that the way you or I would, we'd be without hope, without God. The human race would have ended probably a long time ago. And if it didn't, it'd be destined to a devil's hell. And uh, they might be on another planet. The Lord might be on another planet trying this again, <laughs> learning from his mistakes. Amen. I don't want him ever to feel like he made a mistake by saving David Spurgeon. Why would he ever? Because I failed to appreciate what he did for me. So how do you keep that in the front of your mind with all the garbage? Well, sometimes you got to put the brakes on and remember him. And we're remembering him tonight. We're remembering Golgotha. Uh, the very ones that, uh, uh, that said, uh, that mocked him, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. If you're there tonight and you're not saved, and you're just, you know, cruising through this life, and you've heard the gospel, and you've never made a, you're out of your mind. You don't know what you're doing. God's giving you chance after chance after chance, and you would do well to avail yourself. Well, I don't like the preacher. I don't like, I hear people say, I don't like you. I go, I don't like me either. That doesn't have anything to do with this. If you're in here and you're not saved, Jesus Christ went to the cross. He went to Golgotha. He went to the cross to make a way for your sins to be forgiven. It's a free gift. Huh? Listen, uh, when I was in jail, did you guys know I was in jail? Okay, I know you did. Uh, uh, man, I'll tell you what. Uh, when I, I thought about that thing after the preacher preached on hell being real and the cross being real and forgiveness being a gift and God's all over the world, I thought, man, I'm... 37 years old, I said, I've done a lot of things wrong. I've done a lot of things wrong, but I'll tell you what, the biggest thing I could ever do wrong was to not get in on the gift of eternal life. Amen. And I got in on it. I said, I made a lot of mistakes, but I ain't going to make this one. And uh, I didn't know what I was getting into, but I knew what I was getting out of. That Bible was true. Amen. Amen. And it's all because he went to Golgotha. Let me say this. It says in Galatians chapter 3 and 13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Amen. Let me tell you something about uh, what happened on Golgotha that morning, roughly 2,000 years ago. Uh, Jesus Christ was crucified. It was not a heroic death. I mean, we read in history, I've got war books. We read about men that have laid down their life for their fellow soldiers. We see it even these days. We read it in the news. Somebody, sometimes somebody will, will, will give their life for someone else. That's part of it. That's, that's an admirable trait, especially in this day and age of the victim. But uh, what Jesus Christ did there, that wasn't a heroic death. The Bible said it was a cursed death. It, was a cursed, it wasn't a noble death. It wasn't, it was, he was cursed. He was crucified between two common criminals as a criminal. I'll tell you what it was. It, it was a contradictory death. Amen. Why, how, why? His death gave us life. I got a song here, and uh, don't worry. 
because, yeah, no, I'm not going to sing it. But I am going to read a couple of the lines. Amen. Uh, just for the sake of crime. They said, no, you mean the sake of time. No, if I tried to sing this acapella, it would be criminal. So I'm not. But the song, it goes like this. His heart was broken. Mine was mended. He became sin. Now I am clean. The cross he carried bore my burden. The nails that held him set me free. What a contradiction. Isn't that how it is? He was despised and rejected, stripped of his garments and oppressed. I am loved and accepted, and I wear a robe of righteousness. Man, you can't figure that stuff out. Outside of God's thoughts, like we heard today, being a whole lot different than ours. Amen. It was a contradictory uh, death. It says in Romans chapter 5 that he was crucified. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Amen. That's you. You hear me? Yeah. That's you and me. Uh, God commended his love towards him while we were yet sinners. That's you and me. Amen. And then it says uh, in 1 Peter 3 and, and 18, for Christ also gave, uh, for Christ also hath once suffered for sins, uh, the just for the unjust. What a contradiction. Amen. He got what we deserved. Amen. It said there in John 1 29, the next day Jesus see it, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. A spotless lamb. Uh, was the temporary, substitutionary sacrifice for sin that they had to keep doing over and over. Yesterday, we had Passover at, at our house. My wife did a great job. Amen. First time we, I think we ever cooked lamb in our house. And, and this was scriptural. We went by the numbers, and we did it just like that Old Testament Jew did it to remember. Only we made a, a, a believer's application to every aspect of it. Did a great job, didn't I, girls? Because I got half the church of my grandchildren. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And uh, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, the only Lamb of God, the Lamb of God was the permanent sacrifice for our sin. Amen. And uh, that all took place on Golgotha. 1 Corinthians 15 says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. He took them away the hard way. Beloved, he might have spoke the world, the creation, the universe into existence. He might have created everything in six days. He didn't speak sin out of existence. That means it's way more serious than uh, we give it credit for being sometimes. It was sin, your sin, my sin, that nailed Jesus Christ to the cross. This stuff is needs to be remembered. Sometimes we get to the point where we're like that Pharisee in Luke 18. Thank God I'm not as other men are. Yeah, outside of the grace of Jesus Christ you are, you're worse. Amen. Amen. All right, so I'm almost done. That was uh, Golgotha. That was number four. Oh, we got we to gotta hurt. Oh, too late. Oh, well, we're going to go anyway. And uh, I'm waiting for the hook. You know, I won't go into that. Uh, remember the grave. Now, we just read uh, that he was, uh, that, well, it said that he died for our sin. But then it goes on, the next verse, verse 4 said, and that he was buried. And uh, so it, we're not going to spend much time on the grave because the absolute best part of the grave was that he wasn't there very long, and not even three days. You know, they put him in the yeah, they put him in the tomb, but he wasn't in there. He had things to do. He went to the center of the earth. He dropped off our sins. He preached captivity captive. Amen. He was a busy guy. Amen. He knew that the, that the, if there's any rest, and it's uh, once we get up there. Amen. It says that, and that he was buried and that he rose again. The third day, according to the Baptist. Right? It says according to the scripture. Okay? Uh, he, he was hung on a cross. Well, others were too. He wasn't the only one. And not just them criminals. Not just a form of, uh, of uh, uh, capital punishment for criminals. I mean, they, they had so, them Romans had so much fun. Uh, they crucified Christians by the hundreds and hundreds. Amen. Jesus Christ hung on a cross. So did others. Jesus Christ uh, was buried in a grave. Many, many others have been buried in graves too. We're still doing that. But I'll tell you something else. That Bible said he rose again, and he's the only one that ever did that under his own power. And uh, verse 19 there in 1 Corinthians 15 said, if, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now Christ, now is Christ risen from the dead. I'm not miserable. I've never been happier. I've never had more peace. I tell you something, stuff's going on in the world. Don't faze me one bit. Amen. Say, well, what if they lock us up? 
Well, I have it on uh, inside information that them guys in jail, they need the gospel too. So if you get locked up, just preach to them. Amen? Amen. And, uh, and, uh, but uh, Christ rose, so we, we do have hope in this life and far beyond this life. Are you saved? Amen. Amen. That's you. All right. So that was number five. Moving right along. Remember, remember him glowing up the glory. Take your Bible. Go to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. And, uh, and uh, while, while you're there, let me read a verse out of John 20. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. We heard that this morning. Acts chapter 1 and verse 9 says this. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, uh, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. So he came to finish the work, and when he finished the work, what did he do? He went up to glory. Amen. So remember that. Remember he went to glory. How about this? We'll wrap it up with this right here. How about remember he's coming back? Amen. Amen. Uh, verse, uh, verse 11, uh, there in Acts chapter 1, which also said, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven, this same Jesus, which is taken away from you, uh, okay, which is taken from you into heaven, shall so come in the manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Remember the gathering. I'm looking forward to the gathering. I'm ready to go, but I'm praying for the family plan. What does that mean? I'm praying the trumpet will blow, and we all go together. Tonight would be okay. I don't have any unfinished business. You know, I got it. Oh, by the way, my, my surgery appointment was supposed to be Wednesday. It got moved to the 19th. I don't know why. The Lord knows why. That's his business. Amen. But, uh, man, if I could get a new shoulder, you know, with that new body thing, that'd be even better. I'm going to have so much titanium in me. This will be the third one. Uh, my wife said, if you die first, I'm recycling you. That's what she said. <laughs> Amen. And uh, she's got the recycler's number on speed dial, I think. Amen. You know what it said in John 14. Jesus said, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and he's coming amen, amen. and uh, I want to be faithful I want to be found faithful worthy amen we're not worthy he died for us anyway but uh, amen okay in remembrance of him seven things birth ministry purpose death grave ascension return all with G's I know you, you're proud of me I can tell amen and uh, let me just close with this the world the flesh and the devil will all keep us so busy that if we don't take make a point to put the brakes on in our life once in a while and remember the Lord Jesus Christ we'll forget and it won't change anything you'll still be saved but we'll forget and we'll neglect uh, what he left us here to do and so in a nutshell that is let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works amen. and glorify your father is in heaven amen remembering him amen thank hey He's going he's remembering you. All right, preacher.